Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Test him. Yep. Yeah, I got it. This one maybe. Are we ready? Okay, before we get started, uh, is it Intasari or Asari? Uh, Asari. Asari, okay, thank you. <laughs> she did, she did. <laughs> well, thank you, candidates, for being here. We wanna start off by having you take two minutes for your opening statements. We'll start off with candidate Asari. Thank you so much, um, and also thank you to the Black and Latino Caucuses for hosting this fantastic um, event. Um, my name's Isak, and I'm from Bloomington, um, and I'm running for the U.S. House of Representatives here in the 9th District, but you already knew that. Um, I'm a faculty member at IU, where I direct our cybersecurity and global policy program. Now, in the history-making times that we live in, I think that it's necessary for us to go back to our first principles. What are those first principles? That we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, the chief of which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that we then create government to both establish and to further those rights, and that as a consequence, our government must be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So I'm running to make sure that the basic American contract is fulfilled for every American in this country. I may, I'm running to make sure that our great aspirations become lived realities for everyone. And until that is the case, we know that we still have work to do. To me, policy is now and always will be personal. I'm a cancer survivor. I'm still undergoing treatment for leukemia, but I'm looking very well. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I know that the, the policies that are passed in Washington affect us here in Bloomington. And so on everything, policy is always human-centered. But the story of me having leukemia is not a story of woe or sorrow or defeat. It's the story of finding grace, purpose, and hope in the midst of difficulty. And I think that in the midst of everything that we're going through right now, we all could use a little hope. And so with that, I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Delium Doris, and I'm running for the U.S. House of Representatives for Indiana's 9th Congressional District. I'm a policy-oriented candidate. And I believe in things like anti-war, anti-corruption, Medicare for all, aggressive climate action, workers' rights, tuition-free um, uh, public college, and the legalization of cannabis and many more. I have campaigned on these for the last, for the last two election cycles. Nothing has changed. Um, and I still intend to get out there and uh, get the work done, as I always have. Thank you. And candidate Fife. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. I want to thank the Monroe County Black Democratic Caucus and the 9th District Latino Caucus for hosting this wonderful event. I want to thank all of you for showing up, whether you are online or in person. My name is Matt Fife, and I'm running for the US House of Representatives here in Indiana's 9th. I am a public school teacher. I'm a father of three little ones, and I'm a leader in my labor union. And those kind of values about myself 
are some of the issues and priorities that we care about in this campaign, making sure that we have good workers' rights, uh, the ability to organize, that we have high wages, good benefits, and good retirement for people, making sure that we have great public schools, and making sure that we have good health care so we can raise healthy families. Uh, those are the things that I see in this district. Those are the things that I hear about from people in this district. And when I think about running for office in general, when I think about our current representatives off in DC, I don't often see their priorities reflecting the things that are here in our district. But I think that can change. We can elect officials who are going to DC. We can elect officials who are everyday people. Can you imagine a world in which the people who are in DC are also the people who are here in our community, who are public servants, who are the ones waking up and working and talking with our neighbors? Our policies will better reflect our communities if that's happening. Uh, again, I'm Matt Fife. Um, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy you all are here tonight. Uh, happy to hear about what's, what's happening and, and talk about that. Thank you. OK, thank you. First question goes to candidate Doris. Can you tell us why you're running for this position? I'm running for this position because I, as a voter, was looking for a policy-rich left candidate who had uh, great policies, positions, and substance, who offered more than patronizations and platitudes. Somebody who, will, uh, who if elected, will go to Washington, D.C. and fight for the issues that I most want. And outside of uh, Dan Cannon running, um, you know, I decided I was going to stand up and run for the position. Thank you. Candidate Fife. Uh, similar to why I get up every day and work for my students at school, I think I'm running for this office because I care about my community and my neighbors. Um, when we have to pass referendums to make sure that we have librarians and art teachers, I see policy that's not working for our community. When I talk to my family member who lost continuity of their mental health care because they changed jobs and moved to a different city, I don't see policy that's working. Um, when I speak with individuals right now who are on fixed incomes and they, we see the high gas prices, when we see grocery bills going up, and yet they're worried about their housing, how they're gonna pay for that kind of stuff, that's policy that's not working. Again, we need individuals who understand this and we need individuals who are going to DC who, who will stand up for their community, who are public servants. If we continue to send fundraisers to DC, people who are beholden to big money interests, we're gonna keep getting policies that aren't working for us. Um, and so simply, it's because I care. If you care about people, you care about the policies that impact us and our community. Thank you. When I was just 28 years old. And um, to say it plainly, I think that it's absolutely ridiculous that in the greatest and richest country that has ever existed on planet Earth that we simply cannot afford to get sick. I'm running because the pandemic has made it clear that there are many deficiencies in the way that our government cares for people. I'm running because I'm frustrated with the inaction on climate change or our lack of preparedness for a host of future uh, challenges that are just around the corner from the fourth industrial revolution, to artificial intelligence, to other emerging technologies. I'm running because for too long, our political system has valued profits over people and special interest over the interest of the people of our district. And I am frustrated with the political polarization in this country. But let me be clear, despite the fact that those things make me angry, and I hope that they make you angry too, I'm not running out of anger. I'm running simply because I know and am fully persuaded of the fact that when people in a community get together, any change is possible. I'm running because I have a deep-rooted belief in the American system of governance, and when we work together, we can move our community forward. Um, so simply, I believe that we can do anything that we put our minds to as a community, and that's the reason why I put my, my, my name into the arena to run. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Fife, if elected, what will you do to improve the quality of life for black and brown residents? Thank you. So I've mentioned some of the priorities of this campaign, but I just want to reiterate them in a slightly different light. 
We need to fully fund our schools. Um, we need to make sure that we are creating cultures in our schools that are good in the classrooms, that are, are creating good, uh, that are focused not on testing and standardized testing, but focused on good classroom learning. We need to make sure that we don't have school to prison pipelines in our classroom. Again, that we're creating that culture where every student can learn. On the thought of family health and raising healthy families, we need to make sure that we have good, affordable, quality access to childcare. We have parental leave policies that work for all. We need to, especially here in Indiana, focus on maternal and infant mortality rates. And then, as a strong supporter of unions, we need to make sure that people have the right to organize and have good wages and high wages. Additionally, I just want to mention that I am not the sole person, I am not the person who knows uh, what is best for black and brown residents in our community. And so we need representatives, and I'm saying that I am one, who is willing to listen to black and brown residents, who is willing to reach out, have them be a voice at the table, um, because that's how we create a better community for all. Thank you. Candidate Asari, same question. I support cash transfer programs, um, such as making sure that we continue or make permanent um, the child tax credits. I also support a negative um, tax, um, or what some people would call a universal basic income. MLK, at the end of his life, um, had come to the conclusion that the only and best, most effective way that we can solve racial systemic violence in this country is through establishing a basic standard of living for all Americans. So I am an advocate of doing exactly that. I advocate for single-payer universal health care that will cover people from the day that they're born to the day that they die. Um, Liam will call that Medicare for all. I don't care what you call it. I want it to cover everyone from the day that they're born to the day that they die. We know very well that black and brown communities are disproportionately affected by our cruel health care system. Looking just at one example, Look at black um, uh, um, maternal mortality um, is, 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 is disproportionate. And having a universal health care system would help to address that. I advocate for transformative climate action and climate justice because we know that climate justice is racial justice because, again, black and brown communities are disproportionately affected by climate change and the cost that it's creating for our communities. I advocate for a digital bill of rights to make sure that we also have algorithmic justice because right now, black and brown communities are being totally kept out of the digital economy. Um, and overall, I also advocate for um, reviving um, our democracy, including passing voting rights legislation, publicly funded elections, ranked choice voting, and ending Citizens United. Every single point on my platform will benefit black and brown communities. Thank you very much. Candidate Doris, if elected, what will you do to improve the quality of life for black and brown residents? I want to take a moment and speak about um, justice, not just um, criminal justice, but economic justice. Uh, we, have a, we have a problem in this nation with late stage capitalism. And late stage capitalism uh, leads to um, a lot of unfairness and a lot of um, inequality out there. Uh, right now, we are a top-heavy nation where 90% of um, all the, the wealth and all the assets in this nation belong to, the, to about 1,200 people. Um, and and to the, for the top 1,200 people, uh, they, they, they own um, even more than that. Us in the working class don't really own that much. And so whenever you go out there and you address um, late-stage capitalism, uh, which I refer to as the American oligarchy, and you, and you um, appreciate things like raising the minimum wage, uh, attaching it to cost of living and, and, um, and inflation. And whenever you talk about raising the progressive marginal tax rates on the very wealthiest of, the, uh, of Americans, then we're starting to talk about economic justice. Economic justice isn't, doesn't stop there, though. Uh, I believe, I'm a supporter of Medicare for All, and that right there, getting rid of Right now, the number one cause for bankruptcy in the United States of America is medical debt. And whenever you, whenever you eliminate uh, uh, for-profit insurance companies 
and you go with a Medicare for all system, what happens is people are declaring bankruptcy nearly as often, and people have more money to spend, and they have more um, ability to actually live their lives appropriately. Uh, right now, uh, capitalism has us uh, fighting over, um, over the scraps, and whenever you're fighting over the scraps, minorities get pushed out. And that's something you absolutely positively do not want to happen. Thank you. Okay, my next question is pretty straightforward and uh, probably calls for a pretty straightforward answer too. But I'm gonna ask all three of you to take it to the next level. I want you to put some context to it, put it in perspective and put some meat on your answers, if you will. No pressure, candidate Asari, you get to go first. Do you believe that black lives matter? Yes. Um, now, as you said, you wanted us to put some meat onto that answer. The answer to that question is unequivocal. Yes. It should be unequivocal. Yes. But again, the very fact that we have to continue to ask that question shows the fact that the aspirations of America, where all of us are equal and every life matters and so on and so forth, is simply not true for every American. And that is particularly the case for black Americans. And so, do black lives matter? Yes. Do they matter in practice? Apparently not. And until they matter in practice the way that they matter in theory, then we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Doris. <clears throat> do black lives matter? Absolutely, without a doubt. As I was saying um, in my previous question, whenever late-stage capitalism promotes competition between uh, people for the scraps, uh, they push out um, minority groups. That, include, that doesn't just include black lives, that includes Latino lives and every other min minority, uh, whether it's, it's transgender, whether it's, it's, it's women, and it doesn't, it, it's all there. And the more that they get pushed out, uh, the less equality that we have here. Um, probably the uh, most disproportionately uh, marginalized group is um, the black community here in the United States. And historically, that's always been true. This, this nation has been built on the backs of, of black Americans uh, throughout its history. And the, and the problem is, is that they haven't received anything in return. Um, you know, uh, they, were, they were promised a lot, and a heavy burden is, is owed to them. And the first thing that we can do to make sure that we, we start to uh, adjust that to make where, it's, where everything is uh, better is, is economic justice. We need to have um, uh, the black community more, uh, more in focus because here's the thing, um, is, is you don't measure society by its, the success of the, the, uh, of the very wealthy, you measure society by the uh, by the stri um, strife of the most disproportionately affected communities out there. So whenever you recognize those those communities, and you strive to create a society better, starting at the uh, ground up rather than the top down, then it is, um, in my opinion, uh, the right solutions to have towards the nation. Thank you. Yes. Black Lives Matter, um, and I think many of the candidates tonight have alluded to the fact that it's egregious that this is a question being asked. We need policymakers who are not only willing to, to move past the question to say yes, but to also write and vote for policies that impact, positively impact the black community. Um, I'll end, I guess, the, out of the three of us, I'll end with a little bit of a story of hope though too. Um, I teach in a school every day, and we have clubs, and we have the young people in our school, I'm amazed by them every single day. Um, we have clubs that are working to push both teachers and students to recognize the bias that they're coming into their school with, to, to not only identify that bias, but to interrupt others or themselves when they are identifying that bias, uh, to educate others about that bias, and then to move forward. And that gives me hope that while yes, this is a question today, that we can eventually vote for many policymakers who are going to DC who will 
vote the way that they're saying Black Lives Matter, that we'll vote for policies that move us forward. Um, we have a lot of work to do in that regard, don't get me wrong, but again, I'll at least end it with a little bit of a story of hope. Thank you. Candidate Doris, how have your past experiences shaped your decision to run for office? Whenever, in, in about 2004, 2005, I went to Iraq. And before then, I was not politically active. Um, you know, I had my political leanings. Um, I had never even voted before, though. Um, prior to that, I was in the United States Marine Corps. And whenever I went to Iraq, and I saw the egregiousness of war, and, and saw how things weren't equal for everyone, and how corporations were massively taking over things and not treating people as they should be treated um, and ripping off the American taxpayers. Um, it, slingshot, it slingshot me to the left, the far left. Um, as many of you know, and some of you don't, I'm openly socialist. And seeing the horrors of war, seeing what corporations and the wealthy do to this nation has, has, has pushed me um, so far into the left that I'm, I, I became politically active. I worked for uh, the Obama campaign and the Bernie Sanders campaign, and now I'm on the second campaign of my own. Why? Because I don't really believe that uh, the average American working class member has any say-so anymore in the United States government. Um, and that is something that I'm hoping to actually bring uh, because right now our misrepresentatives in, in the uh, House do not actually represent us. They represent their large money donors. Right now, money equals uh, free speech and corporations are people. And I really don't think that should be the case. Um, and I would like to go there and overturn things like Citizens United, Buckley versus Vallejo, and everything um, and, and pave the way to where there's free and fair elections so that the people of the United States can be represented rather than the corporations that they follow. Uh, candidate Fife. Thank you. Have my past experiences uh, led to this decision to run? So I grew up in a union household. Uh, my dad worked for a railroad for 45 years, and I didn't know it at the time. We weren't rich by any means, but um, we had our needs taken care of both through benefits uh, when my mom would get sick, uh, needed surgery. Um, you know, I, I always had a bat or a glove when going to Little League, things like that. And nowadays, my parents have a good retirement. Uh, my first three years of teaching, I realized, uh, you know, that, that's my dream job, I think. And, but I quickly realized the policies we're putting in place from the federal and state level don't always match what we need to do for our students to grow up and be passionate about what they want. Um, I went back and got a public policy degree, um, and so I have used that to continue teaching and be an organizer in my union, which has led me to probably one of the biggest decisions, uh, the biggest impacts that I'm now, the reason of now why I'm running. Being in a union has taught me that you can be the change you want to be. I, I went through an early leadership program in my union, and the, the cohort that I went through it with, we often advocate with each other. Um, and if we see change that we need, whether it be in the union or around us, we say, hey, you can be the one to stand up to do that. And so when I see these, uh, I've spoken about them a little bit, but when I see these needs in our community, um, and I speak with those around me, it keeps getting reflected back. I can be that change. We can be that change. If you want to see a difference in your community, you can be the one to stand up and talk and organize. And so I think those three kind of decisions of mine or values of mine growing up have led to this decision to me to run for public office. Thank you. Candidate Asari, how have your past experiences shaped your decision to run for office? Thank you for the question. Um, I've said it several times here tonight, but um, when I was diagnosed with leukemia, um, <laughs> while, while I was being told, and at the time, you know, what it sounds like to you, you see me now, it probably, um, 
you may think similarly, but um, at the time, you know, it sounded like they were just telling me that I was dying. And um, in fact, they were. And in the midst of the doctor giving me his prognosis, a care worker came in to say, we have to talk about how you're going to pay for it. And um, I just don't think that that's an experience that anyone should have. In this district, there are 50,000 people who do not have health insurance. Um, there are hundreds of thousands others who have health insurance and, like myself, still can't afford to be sick. That's informed so much of, of, of what I'm doing and why I'm running. Um, as somebody who works in emerging technology and works in cyber policy, I'm worked, I've worked across government on these issues. I'm quite worried about the fact that um, we're not doing enough to prepare for very serious challenges that are ahead. Just as one simple example, there are currently 579,000 unfilled jobs in cybersecurity in the United States alone that we do not have people to fill. That's our, that's our critical infrastructure. That's our elections. Um, that's our ability to continue to operate as a free and fair society that we live in. And so everything that I've done has led me to this point um, to make policy personal, to make sure that we're fo future focused, but human centered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, gentlemen, for your answers. Please take one minute for your closing statements. We will start with candidate Fife. Uh, the U.S. House seat here in the ninth, and there's a state seat close by, are two open seats. We need to get excited about that as Democrats. We need to get out there and sign people up to vote, to get them excited to vote. Um, no matter who you're going to vote for, let's get out there and do it. We, we can make a change if we do it together. We can make a change if we are working towards these goals that we have talked about tonight, that all three candidates and, and candidates in their other discussions have talked about tonight, and we can do it together. So I urge you um, to sign up. I urge you to take your time. Uh, I urge you to, to get out there and make a difference. Um, lastly, if you want more information about the campaign, you can go to mattfife.com. Thanks. Candidate Asari. I really want to thank everyone um, for being here tonight. Um, y, y hubiera dicho al, al principio que gracias al este foro latino también por organizar este foro. Eh, usted me dijo que tenía que hablar en español, entonces pues ya lo hice. Um, but the thing that I want to say is this. Um, the reality is that nihilism is the biggest enemy to progress. When we start believing that all of our efforts are not going to lead to change, and we stop trying, and as a party we stop organizing and we stop reaching out, we stop believing that what we're working toward is possible, then we've lost. And so my whole message and my whole reason for running is to ensure that we as a party continue to reach for the dreams that we're fighting for. Because if we do, change will come. Thank you so much for having me. I would just like to thank the host uh, to tonight's forum um, and everybody who's in attendance. Um, again, my name is Liam Doris, and I'm running for the U.S. House of Representatives. My website is dliamdoris.com. In closing, I would just like to say to everybody out there who's ever considered running, uh, if, you're, if you're passionate about something, if you really think that, that things can change, you know, don't just sit on the sidelines. Get out there. You know, it doesn't matter what level you run at. Run. And go out there and take what is, what is ours. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Five-minute break to check on the sound. And we'll be right back with you.